Hello everyone. In today's class on advanced characterization techniques, we are going to try and learn something about extended X-ray absorption fine structure as well as surface extended uh, X-ray absorption fine structure and near edge X-ray absorption fine structures. In the last couple of classes, we have been talking about diffraction as well as scattering of X-rays as well as electrons. But in today's class, we are going to focus on how we can use X-rays for getting spectroscopic information and therefore chemical uh, information uh, from the material or uh, substance under consideration. So as you can see over here, there are two different uh, techniques, namely the extended X-ray absorption fine structures, the same technique with a different geometry known as surface extended X-ray absorption fine structure and near edge X-ray absorption tech, uh, fine structure which are put together as X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So in today's class, we will just get acquainted with these techniques. I would like to mention that uh, both the techniques namely the uh, e, uh, extended X-ray absorption fine structures as well as the near edge X-ray absorption uh, fine uh, structures is based on similar principle. However, they differ in the regime of operation uh, of operation in terms of energy. More about it later. So let us go back and see what exactly uh, we have understood earlier in the course of our earlier lectures. So all of us know and which uh, something that I emphasized that extended X-ray absorption fine structures is essentially a spectroscopic technique and it gives us information about the chemical composition. However, unlike techniques like EDS that is energy dispersive spectroscopy, EXXAFs gives us information at the angstrom level about the chemical content or the chemical environment of a particular atom under consideration. It is based on the same uh, X-ray absorption edge which we had touched upon in our second uh, class while we were uh, understanding the instrumentation involved in X-ray diffraction. So just to recollect it again, here you can see a normal spectrum as a function of wavelength for say something like copper uh, target. Herein you see how we get the absorption for a nickel filter and here you see that the absorption essentially increases with the increase in wavelength. However, at a particular wavelength, there is a sudden drop in the intensity and this occurs because of absorption. So our today's technique XFs essentially focuses on this kind of a phenomena, this absorption edge that we are seeing in the figure discussed over here. So we know that how does X-ray interact with matter? We had talked about elastic interaction which leads to diffraction. Now the diffraction can be either wide angle X-ray scattering which we carry out on a routine basis in laboratories or it can be uh, according to small angle X-ray scattering which we had touched upon in the third and the fourth lecture. At the same time inelastic scattering that leads to Compton scattering which is studied using the X-ray Raman effect was also touched upon in an earlier lecture by my uh, colleague. However, what we are going to talk today about essentially is X-ray absorption. So herein you can see that there is a decrease in intensity of the X-ray as it passes through a material. So the extent to which this decrease in intensity occurs depends on the absorption coefficient mu which essentially decides the extent to which intensity of energy beam is reduced as it passes uh, through a material. The absorption edge that we had seen earlier is essentially a sharp discontinuity in absorption spectrum of X-ray when energy of photon correspond to energy of a shell of the atom. Now we are going to talk about it in the next slide but let me, let me just uh, you know kind of uh, put it mathematically the how absorption uh, can be quantified. So if the incident uh, beam is of the intensity I0 passes through a material uh, with thickness of X, the amount of attenuation that occurs is actually uh, uh, e uh, to the power minus mu by X where mu is the absorption coefficient and therefore the in intensity after passing through the material gets modulated as I is equal to I0 E raised to minus mu by X. If we incorporate the density of the material, we can get 
i is equal to i0 e raise to minus mu by rho into rho x. This is particularly important when we are considering mixture of various material and we can take the weighted average of the absorption coefficient as well as the density. Generally it has been found out that the relationship between mu and rho is not only wavelength dependent but also atomic number dependent. Now on the right hand side we can again see the similar curve of what we had seen earlier where we have a critical energy Wk for ejection of k electrons from nickel and this corresponds to a steep drop in the intensity and leads to absorption of the x-rays of the copper x-rays what we had seen in the earlier case. Having said that what are the kinds of interactions that can occur when a particular uh, photon of a, uh, of a particular wavelength is incident on a, ma on a material. So if a x-ray photon of energy h nu is incident and has sufficient energy it can knock off an inertial electron. In order to do that the energy of the x-ray photon has to be greater than the binding energy of the electron. Once this electron is knocked off uh, from the inner shell it can go and become a part of the continuum. There are other uh, possible scenarios that can also occur. Having said that if the electron from the inner shell is knocked off and goes to the continuum we can get a transition from outer shell to the inner shell and this transition is accompanied with a release of another photon which has a wavelength that is different from the incident photon. This phenomena is known as fluorescence and we, are, we can also use the fluorescent photon to uniquely characterize the material under or rather the element under consideration. Another possibility is that in case this inertial electron is knocked off uh, we can also have a release of another OJ electron from the outer shells in order to accommodate this uh, uh, phenomena. So all this including the fluorescent photon as well as the OJ electron or the photo electron will essentially characterize the element under consideration. If we can uniquely identify and correlate either the photo electron, the OJ electron or the fluorescent photon with a particular element we can get chemical information about the same. Now this is uh, this philosophy is used in a variety of spectroscopy technique and X-ray absorption spectroscopy which comprises of uh, extended X-ray absorption fine structures as well as near edge X-ray absorption fine structure which is also known as Zanes uh, is no exception. This is this these techniques is a uh, comprise of modulation of X-ray absorption coefficients at or near the absorption edge. So here again let us go back and have a look. So this is where we have an absorption edge and here you can see the wavelength. So how and therefore the frequencies also and you can see that what all modulation occurs near the absorption edge is what is used as a fingerprint for the presence of a particular element using uh, in these techniques. So let us look how exactly the pattern looks like. So if you recollect this is how the absorption edge looks like. So in this case since it is energy you see we are going this way here is the absorption edge and again it goes on increasing with decreasing energy. However you notice if you are the modulations which can be seen in this pattern. Here again I would like to point that the technique Zanes x-ray absorption near edge structures are found very close to this particular absorption edge while extended x-ray absorption fine structures as the name suggests is far away therefore extended right. So all of them uh, these modulations which are far off are essentially known as extended absorption fine edge structures. Now to emphasize that whenever we talk about absorption edges it has to be specific. So if you want to study a particular element you have to focus a particular edge. Now this point is made clear in the spectrum shown over here. So here again we see that indeed we are having two uh, uh, absorption edges the L3 absorption edge of lead and the L3 absorption edge of bismuth. So in the present scenario we are focusing on the 
L3 absorption edge of lead, the region which is very near to this edge essentially comprises of Zane's spectra, while the region far away comprises of extended X-ray absorption fine structure. So, this transition or this differentiation between exafs and zanes is a bit arbitrary, though there are ways uh, of kind of quantifying it as a thumb of rule generally it is considered that at a wavelength of the or energy of the order of 100 electron volt from the absorption edge zanes is valid, while beyond say 50 to 100 electron vo volts. Uh, extended X-ray absorption fine structure are valid. So, as I had mentioned exafs starts from 50 to 1000 electron volt from the absorption edge. I hope you appreciate that at in, with increase in the energy uh, we see that there is uh, uh, the, the oscillations that we are getting essentially die out. Having said that absorption of X-ray photon is actually accommodated by emission of photo electron. Now, this photo electron unlike in the normal case uh, tends to behave like a wave right like this is uh, the basis of, uh, of uh, wave particle duality wherein you see that uh, our sub subatomic particles can also behave as wave. Uh, having said that these the wave formed because of the photo electron actually interacts with the neighboring atoms and therefore, they get scattered from there not only that there is an interference between outgoing as well as back scattered photo electron wave and this leads to interference. Now, this is something that we had uh, talked about time and again right like we have the X rays which are going they meet in phase there is constructive uh, uh, interference if they meet out of phase uh, there is destructive interference. So, something very similar to it is happening however, this is happening very locally and at the atomic level. And these modulations are essentially seen in the Zanes uh, or for that matter XF spectra and this essentially contributes to all the oscillations that we are seeing over here. So, all these oscillations that come we will have a better figure later in the class, but the situation is very similar to what has been shown in the figure. So, here we see we have our essentially uh, atom which is actually emitting electron waves. So, you see the electron waves are going the moment they interact with another atom what actually happens is they are back reflected right they are back scattered and once these propagating and these back reflected they interfere right they interfere and depending on that we get if there is constructive interference high intensity and if there is destructive interference we get low intensity and this leads to essentially the oscillations that we saw in the XAFs spectrum. So, what kind of uh, interaction that can take place what I showed in the earlier figure is a very simplistic uh, assumption and here each and every atom is essentially just reflecting the waves in nice spherical form. However, this may not be true there are various kinds of interaction that may occur. So, here we have uh, some possible scattering um, or multiple scattering events have been uh, figured out over here. So, here in the first case we see a single scattering path right. So, like you uh, the electron wave is scattering from uh, the red atom to say the green atom and uh, it is getting reflected from the green back to the red right. While in this case we have a double scattering path which is shown over here ok and we get uh, mostly for forward scattering angle of close to 180 degrees. Similarly, there is also quadrilateral triple scattering path and also triangular triple scattering path. I am not going to go in details, but I hope you appreciate that depending on the kind of interaction we are having all the mode of oscillation is uh, of the pattern is going to vary. Now, having said that we can always find out what kind of interaction is going to occur between the two at neighboring atoms and what do we expect to get as a output more about it later, but remember that for a given atom the kind of interaction that takes place depends on its neighborhood. Now, this is the very uh, genesis of the X-ray absorption spectroscopy technique, wherein we can get really inform uh, uh, information about the atomic uh, about the atomic neighborhood of a particular atom or particular element under consideration, because remember in this case we are focusing only at the 
absorption edge of one particular element like you can see over here. So, you focus on one particular element and you see the modulations for that particular element. So, we see that okay, if I have lead somewhere what is the neighborhood of lead, uh, of lead ok. So, this is how it works out. Now, moving ahead as I had reiter, uh, as I had mentioned exams gives information about the neighboring atoms. Not only that it tells us what is the approximate atomic number because remember at the end of the day the scattering tendency of the atoms is essentially dependent on their structure factor uh, and which you are quite aware varies as the uh, as a function of the atomic number. Having said that another important point that is very uh, uh, relevant is the distance between the two atoms. If you remember we whenever we talk about interference what really matters is we are essentially going from the real space to reciprocal space. So, the same kind of thing happens over here and depending on the distance we are going to see whether we get constructive or destructive interference. So, all this information uh, we do get using uh, exaps. However, it is highly modulated. Having said that one of the biggest advantage that we have with exaps is that it works very well for crystalline as well as amorphous materials. While our X rays particularly when we talk about diffraction gives us very little information about amorphous material. At the same time exaps can also be used for studying solids, glasses, liquids and even gas. Having said that one of the biggest advantage of exaps is in studying in situ processes that occur in different class of materials. However, XFs is not really as common as other spectroscopy technique right EDS and the main reason for that is we need tunable X-rays to capture a particular edge. I hope you appreciate that whenever uh, I showed the earlier images we were going at a particular value of the absorption edge and this means we need a source for X-ray which can give us energy over a particular range and this not only that we also need a energy resolution which is very very good of the order of 10 power minus 4, 4 volt in 1 volt. And therefore, most likely and in most cases we have to uh, use a synchrotron source for carrying out XAPS study. Having said that the main driving force for carrying out XAPS is to study light elements like carbon, oxygen and nitrogen. Now, these elements cannot be very well studied using conventional spectroscopic technique. Having said that we talked about different kind of uh, interactions that occur namely the electron the free electron that is given out once a photon energy is absorbed. We also talked that you know there can be a fluorescent e uh, x-ray that can come off and there can also be an OJ electron. So, all these signals can be used in XFs in one way or the other to get some information about the localized chemical composition. Having said that XAPS is generally used in transmission as well as fluorescent mode to get the relevant information. A general instrument uh, that uh, wherein we can carry out XAPS is shown over here and you can see that we have a beam coming out from synchrotron. However, we need a double crystal monochromator to get a particular range of energy and we need a incident flux monitor to see what is the intensity of the incident x-rays ok. Then it has to interact with our sample if it is working in transmission mode you can see that the, uh, x, uh, the synchrotron beam passes right through the sample and we have a transmitted flux monitor which monitors the intensity after the x-rays have passed through the sample. At the same time we also have a fluorescence detector to see what all kind of uh, uh, fluorescent photons or fluorescent x-ray that we are getting. So, having said that you I hope you appreciate that we can get information about the chemical uh, environment in a particular material either using the fluorescence signal or the transmission signal. The point uh, that is to be noted here is that in the transmitted signal the frequency of the incident and the transmitted uh, wave remains the same while in fluorescence 
there is a change in the intensity of the uh, int no, not only the in, uh, there is change in the frequency of the incident photon. Having said that for detecting the intensity of the x-rays we essentially use ionization chambers other uh, detectors like photodiodes, photomultipliers as well as solid state energy dispersive detectors as well as wavelength dispersive detectors which we had touched upon uh, earlier in this module as well as I am sure it must have been covered in the, uh, in the earlier part of this course by my colleague. Uh, but most likely what we use uh, in case of extended X-ray absorption fine structures are ionization chambers as they provide high flux and wide energy range. Now that we have gone, so you see how simple, we have a very simple exhaust technique, right? The instrumentation part has got nothing exotic. However, one of the most important criteria is the synchro availability of synchrotron. Having said that, you see with such a simple uh, instrumentation, there are there is a strong capability to carry out in situ experiments. So, we can vary temperature, pressure, doping as well as orientation and concentration in a solution and study how the chemical composition is of the material under consideration is changing as a function of external stimuli. Another important thing that I have uh, that I have not mentioned yet is that there is ability uh, for us to get the synchrotron and use a polarized property of X-ray. And if you have polarized uh, uh, wave of uh, synchrotron or uh, X-rays, we can see get sufficient information about the orientation. This me, uh, orientation I mean uh, like the kind of bonds that we are having between A and B. So, by XFs you can know that you know A is surrounded by B, but if you use polarized uh, X-rays we can not only know that you know A is surrounded by B or C, but also at what angle it is uh, uh, aligned with respect to A. This is particularly important for deciding the chemical bonding between the two species. So, as we had already discussed exafs what we do we excite the core electron to higher unoccupied or continuum state. Now for this we need a energy tunable source of x-ray photon to illuminate the sample. For instance if I am having a compound say A, B, C, D and I want to study what is uh, the neighborhood of say A and uh, A or B then I should be in a position to tune my energy to the absorption edge of A, B, C or D. Having said that another important point is that what all we are getting, what all pattern we are getting, it is not just the absorption edge as the name suggests this is extended X-ray absorption fine structure. So, we should have the ability to uh, provide photons with energy a few hundreds of electron volt below the absorption edge and up to few thousands of electron volt beyond the absorption edge. Okay. So, there is a strong energy dependence of the absorption spectrum and we should be in a position to control the energy and therefore, we have to use a synchrotron which gives us a energy resolution of 10 power minus 4 volt in about 10 volt. So, as we can see the exafs data is characterized by a step function centered at binding energy broadened by measurement resolution lifetime of core hole and monotonically decreases with energy. Remember what all we are getting is happening at the absorption edge. So, let us go back and just look at the absorption edge. So, if you go to the absorption edge this is where you knock off an electron from the inner shell and then there are uh, these interaction between the electron wave right uh, and this interaction leads to the oscillations that we are getting. So, in order to get that this there is a lot of superimposition of the signals because there is not just one scattering event there is easily a situation wherein you can get multiple scattering and therefore, this makes analysis of the data slightly complicated. However, a very simple governing equation is given over here. So, here you see the chi of k is essentially summation n of uh, j which is nothing but the number of atoms which are surrounding a particular atom or element under consideration. 
the fjk exponential minus 2k square by sigma square is essentially the disorder term which actually decreases in intensity with the number of oscillations and there is a electron inelastic scattering term. So, here you see we have a scattering term uh, which essentially comes from elastic scattering and here we have the inelastic scatter scattering term which actually determines the interference right. So, we have to see how much interference is occurring. Okay, so, this elastic uh, uh, electron ela in, in, in elastic scattering term is this one the second exponential. The first exponential over here is actually the elastic scattering right like which uh, dampens and this interference term essentially decides what kind of an oscillation pattern that we are going to get. As you can see from this equation the period of oscillations increases with the increase in frequency. Uh, having said that also there is an increase in the uh, period of oscillation with increase in r where r is the distance between uh, the atoms under considerations and also the intensity chi e actually increases as we have more and more j assuming that or more or more and more atoms assuming that all of them are scattering in phase. Okay. So, now let us go and see how exactly uh, uh, exact data looks like. So, you see here this is again our energy versus absorption coefficient and you see the same thing we do see that instead of getting a sharp drop we do see a few modulations over here. This does not show a lot of uh, information. However, once we convert it to chi k, uh, k cube versus k we see that there are lot of oscillations. I will tell you the reason why we are multiplying it with k cube. And I hope you appreciate that essentially it is done to actually see the oscillations at higher value of energy. As we move away from the energy uh, from the absorption peak we see that there is a lot of damping effect. So, in order to see the oscillations if we plot chi of k versus k cube we do see all the oscillations. Now another important thing is this k is essentially in the reciprocal space. So, that is why you see over here we have the angstrom inverse. Right. Now, this information can be taken back and plotted in the real space and we do get this as a function of r which is nothing but the distance actual distance between the atoms under considerations and this shows the intensity. Right. So, this is what we are going to try and match when exactly we take the data. So, now I am going to show you some things about uh, how exactly we do uh, uh, XF's data analysis. Having said that I should mention that you know we use well developed software at different synchrotron sources and one such software is IFFIT which is used at University of Chicago. Now, these are available for free and what you can do is you, you can take and try to analyze what all data we are getting from different synchrotron sources. So, you see over here this is what we have this is what the kind of data that we get fine which is nothing but mu of E versus the electron uh, versus the energy. Right. So, this mu of E comprises of both the things right for, for your Zane's data which is very close to the absorption edge right which is shown over here and which we can separate and the data which is far off from the absorption edge. But even before we do that once we get a signal the first and the foremost thing that we do is to subtract the background and this is what has been shown over here. So, we subtract the pre edge background and then we normalize it. We can also separate the zanes or a, a region which is very close. So, you see we have gone almost up to 100 electron volt and said that you know up to 100 electron volt I have zanes and beyond that I have x-ray absorption fine edge structures. We continue with that and after doing all our pre edge subtraction we carry out post edge, edge subtraction and here you see the kind of oscillations that we are getting right quite a few bit of oscillations. Now, what we do is we take the same part after subtracting the background and our chi of k versus the k and you see this is the actual data that we get after doing entire background correction. As we had seen earlier in order to see or in kind of uh, modulate and uh, see the oscillations you can plot chi of k versus k square. Uh, into k square versus k and here you see how we get the modulated oscillations and they are easily visible. Now, all these modulations correspond to a particular interference occurring between two atoms. Okay. So, now if you see this is how it looks like we had plotted chi of k versus k. Now, the same information can be taken back 
and plot it in real space. So now you see we have chi of r versus r and this r is in angstrom and here you see we are seeing some characteristic peaks. Having said that if you remember this chi of r that we are having as well as r itself the Fourier transform of chi of r it has a real part and a imaginary part. So we have tried to match the real part and we do indeed see that you know the red one shows that okay there is a good match. Having said that please note that you know there is uh, the intensity is dying off at higher values of r and uh, once we plot you know um, k square versus chi of k versus k you see that you know all the oscillations are visible and we can see that there is a good match though it is not visible over here. Having said that once we get our chi of r versus r we can go back in uh, literature and actually find out what corresponds to which peak corresponds to what. So this is just like JCPDS or ICDD where we have a database. So here we can see that this peak which we get between 1 and 1.5 angstrom essentially corresponds to FEO while between 2 to 3 actually corresponds to FE, FE uh, and FE. So by doing like this we can see that we can fit in all different kinds of peaks and get individual contribution from individual for that matter here iron iron and iron oxide peaks not only in the real but also the reciprocal space. I hope with this analysis it is very clear that we can identify not only what all atoms are present in the neighborhood but also at what distance they are present and therefore this technique gives us information about the chemical surrounding at the angstrom level. Here again I have just mentioned to you that we can carry out various tests in situ like heating as well as applying pressure. So just to show you what kind of effect we have if we apply temperature we see that there is a continuous decrease with increase in temperature. So these are some practical limitations that we have but remember the kind of oscillations all these corresponds to all these oscillations actually correspond to the interference between the waves that are uh, being you know scattered from the surrounding atoms and you see that as we increase the temperature there is a decrease in the oscillations okay. Another important parameter this chi of k I hope uh, you remember like if we, if we start if we go back uh, to the first curve we see in this case we have mu of phi which is nothing but your distribution and here I have swiftly shifted and, and I did not mention what exactly is chi of e but let me just write that chi of e is nothing but mu of e minus mu okay I have gone on the wrong side it is not just okay let, let me just do it over here. So let me say that this is my chi of e is equal to mu of e minus mu 0 of e so this is nothing but the differential term okay of mu 0 okay so this is what we have done over here okay so having said that what all we have talked about up till now is the basic right the basic physics uh, for doing extended x-ray absorption fine structures and I hope you appreciate that we are talking about very thin samples mostly I mentioned that you know we have uh, a sample large enough so that the x-rays uh, are able to pass through it. However, there are instances when we are looking at surface phenomena and there th uh, that is where grazing incidence uh, uh, is very important and if we carry out the same x-ray absorption fine structures in uh, grazing incidence mode it is known as surface enhanced XFs or SEXAFS. Now the biggest advantage that we have is that we can irradiate a region extending from nanometer to millimeter range just by changing the angle of incidence. Having said that we can also use the same concept of detecting either the reflectant beam or the fluorescence or even low energy electron namely the OG electrons to get some information about the chemical uh, environment of a particular element under consideration. As I had already mentioned that the original equation of XAPS breaks down at lower k where we have this near uh, edge x-ray absorption fine structures at uh, in this energy range 
actually what happens is there are multiple scattering events and the dynamical calculations have to be incorporated. Now these are too involved and as such uh, Zane's uh, uh, rather uh, Zane's or near edge X-ray absorption fine structures is actually used only as a fingerprint technique by which I mean that if you see a particular uh, you know peaks in the Zane spectra we can say that okay this particular element is present. However, we the quantitative analysis of this technique has not developed till date. However, the Zanes gives a lot of qualitative information about the coordination chemistry, molecular orbitals, band structure as well as various multiple scattering events that can occur in a material. Having said that, I hope you, ha you appreciate that we can get excellent short range order information about chemical environment using X-ray absorption spectroscopy. We can also use this technique to study crystalline amorphous as a materials as well as liquids. However, synchrotron radiation is almost always necessary for carrying out X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Another important uh, disadvantage that we have uh, is though we know the chemical composition or the chemical surrounding, we have absolutely no idea about the oxidation states. And the theory that is involved for understanding exafs as well as zanes is pretty complicated and this complicates the use of this technique in getting some information with high fidelity. Thank you.